Absolute scorcher today, mate, isn't it? Yeah, oh. tell me about it. What are you, uh, what are you reading? Um, brief history of time. Oh, yeah. I'm 50 pages in. He's not even mentioned sectionals yet. <laughs> Absolute amateur. Yeah, what does he know about racing? Oh. Glad we booked this holiday instead of doing the flat back. Oh, absolutely. Garner doesn't know what he's missing. Mm. Oh, no, wait. It's Matt that's on holiday. So we're doing the flat pack? Oh, thank you. Hello and welcome back to the Flat Pack, episode six. My name is Ross Briley, and as the flat season and the planet continues to hot up, luckily we're here to find the best and the worst of last week's and next week's angles in the racing world. Uh, normally, I'm joined in the box in Leeds by Keith Melrose and Matt Gardner. Unfortunately, due to his poor performance in Beat Keith last week, Matt Gardner has been fired from the show. Uh, and it's just me, and Keith Melrose set in this beautifully, beautifully air-conditioned bunker key uh, to go through last week's racing and next week's racing. I never thought I'd appreciate uh, being stuck underground in Leeds as much as I do today. Yes, I know exactly where I'm going to come when the thermonuclear war starts. I'm going to <laughs> yeah. come straight to the box. Yeah, that should be all right because if we can, we're, we're positively cool in here. Uh, Matt Gardner couldn't make it this week, unfortunately. No, uh, it was terrible what you did to him. <laughs> Summarily dismissed. Look. He has to up his, he has to learn. He needs to up his game in the Beat Keith quiz at the end, which doesn't happen this week, of course, because Matt has uh, has gone. But he is an integral part of the show. Yeah, of course he is. Uh, and because of that, uh, let's just take a moment to look back at Matt's best bits from the first five episodes. Um, I've no idea. Uh, last I, would, I would like to talk about cycling more, but yeah. everyone else would like you to talk about it less. Okay. Remembering Matt Gardner, who is on holiday this week, <laughs> Keith. Let's go back uh, at uh, last week's race. And we start the show, as ever, with one lesson learned. Uh, this, uh, this whole concept is to, uh, to take us through the, uh, the flat season and, uh, and hopefully learn a few things because, uh, like I said, the form is a, is a tricky beast. Um, punting on horse racing is, uh, as ever, um, difficult at the best of times. Uh, and you don't always get it right. The moment you think you've got it cracked, Keith, you haven't. You know what I said off here, didn't you? I, I mean, I've had a, I had a poor week this week. It was yeah. one of those weeks where, you know, nothing seems to go right. And the one that actually came a bit closer was where I got my lesson from this week. I had a, buy, a bet on the Green Man at Newmarket on Saturday. Yeah. Uh, and I did the spotlights for the race as well, so you see what my thoughts were pre-race were there. And Akaringa was punted off the boards and beat the Green Man. And I thought, oh, Stuart Williams punting one. Deary me. So I looked into it, but he's had a terrible season as well. He I hasn't, thought, yeah, yeah. well, this is what I did. I looked into it. And he always has a relatively modest April, May, June. Yeah. So one, he has a good all weather season. And then start of the turf season tends to be quiet. Then July and or sometimes, but mostly August, September, October, Williams does a lot better. So we've been looking, every, when I was watching in April, every horse that disappeared at the back of the telly, oh, that'll be Stuart Williams because they're just not running well. Mm. The yard is coming to that time of year where they might start picking more up. And it cost me money on, on Saturday with Akaringa getting backed. Under conditions that suited him, it's the sort of bet you'd have liked, I think, Akaringa. Yeah. Proper uh, six, yeah, six furlongs fast ground, clearly been targeted back at the track where it wouldn't yeah, last year. Hadn't been shown much form, which was the reason I wasn't too up on him. But mm. uh, they backed him and he came and he won. And it might just be this is just part of uh, Stuart Williams' natural rhythm. And the yard's going to come back. They'll have some well-handicapped horses now. Uh, so I'll be watching out for his horses from now on because they have basically pulled a stroke on Saturday. So that's, the lesson is keep an eye on Stuart Williams. It's, we've, we've written him off. Yeah, uh, we've written him off as a bad season so far. It's yeah. not. It's pretty much what we expect from him, actually, when you look at the stats. Sure, yeah. And that again, that goes for a lot of these. This is, again, the whole point of the, the, the flat season is there's so much going on. There are so many races. There are so many options um, that you can kind of miss those rhythms and those peaks and those troughs and, uh, and, and, and kind of, yeah, miss that... Clearly, some trainers are. He's a very much a trainer you would miss because we know about how stout he operates. We know about yeah, how yeah, Gosden yeah. operates, all the big yards, etc. Williams, he's a tier two trainer. You know, he still operates on the Saturday races. We still see a lot of his horses in yeah. big races. However, he's not a sort of trainer that everyone will know his rhythms. I didn't until I looked in yesterday. 
and now I do. Okay, there you go. I'll keep an eye out for Stuart Williams then. He might well be bouncing back to form as the, uh, the, the ground gets faster. Let us know what your lessons uh, that you've learned over the past week or the flat season in general as well, and we'll read them out. We've had a couple from, uh, from last week. Nick Palfrey got in touch. He says, on Sunday I backed Garris in France, uh, but when in two lights I was concerned he wasn't the same horse as last year when he went over course and distance, uh, and he didn't realise that Double or Bubble had frank the Abernon in the July Cup until I watched it uh, uh, all the weekend action on Monday. That was his lesson learned. And uh, well, I think we both applied to that because that is a big thing, isn't it? That you can't, there's so much going on, especially on a Friday and Saturday with six, seven, eight meetings, that you can go back and go, oh God, I didn't realise that the, the horse who finished ninth in that race has come out and, and yeah. run 10 pounds above it. I, I watched, because I, I didn't I didn't actually back Gaz, but I, I previewed the race for a, a contract we're doing and looked at that race. And I watched the Platinum Jubilee again on the basis of it. And yeah. I spotted Gareth's shape better than, than it looked it appeared at the time. So that I was more thinking of the Ascot form. You know, mm. Nick's thinking of earlier form than that. He's thinking of Newmark or Double or Bubble Run, a really good race in the July Cup the day before. It's just but, just trying to keep up, isn't it? Trying to keep up with the is is this good form? Uh, and it can literally happen. It could happen like could happen now. Yeah, it could happen two hours before you you, you look at a race in the morning. Mm. You think I'm going to have a punt in the three o'clock. Uh, something goes and wins the one thirty, and you go, oh yeah, God, yeah, that was from the same race. Especially on those on those big weekends, isn't it? And I was I was saying in the comment I left in response to Nick, it's so different to I do chasers during the winter, and the amount of times you think, oh, I love that race. Yeah, it's about five. Yeah. They're all novice handicaps worth twenty five grand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but on the flat, every week. Yeah. Just looking at these sprinters, every three year old race, just about, I'm looking and going, I fancy that form. Yeah, yeah. Loads and loads of good form. It is much, much harder to keep up. Mark Armstrong, 100, got in touch. Um, sorry that uh, 99 of your name were already taken. Uh, he says, uh, just follow the Ascot form, just follow the Ascot form, just follow the Ascot form. First perfect alibi, now Chateau, both nicking it from my fancies today. Really should have just listened to you guys and just followed the Ascot form. The third time you said that, I heard it in the Munchkin's voice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Follow the Ascot form on that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hopefully everybody else is doing that now as well. Yeah, yeah, that's it. Follow the Ascot form. Yeah, there we go. Um, the uh, yeah, the Wizard of Oz. Uh, if you if you're remaking it, give us a shout. We'll uh, we'll get involved. Uh, okay, so plenty of lessons learned from last week's uh, racing. Like I said, please comment below uh, if you do have something you want us to mention. Uh, not on next week's show because we won't be here for Glorious Goodwood. Uh, but uh, uh, do put uh, anything you want us to uh, read out on uh, episode seven, which will be coming up in a couple of weeks' time. Now it's time to step into the DeLorean and go back in time, but not to 1985, but to Friday, Saturday and Sunday as we go through the weekend's action now that the dust has settled. Uh, with Newbury and the Curra taking centre stage, of course. Uh, sprinters in the Hackwood, Super Sprinters in the Super Sprint. Uh, Grocer Jack uh, delivered the goods. There you go, uh, for uh, William Haggis as well. A Magical Lagoon took advantage of Emily Upjohn's cancelled flight to win a, uh, obviously, below par Oaks with the Antipos favourite not making it to the track. But what did we make of the racing? And what do we take out of it angles-wise? Keith Mel Rose. Yeah, I mean, the Super Sprint, uh, it's normally matched the main. Had to yeah. give it a good watch, but it's always these early two-year-old races. And the Super Sprint, is it the last one? Maybe not quite, where it's just all about speed, isn't it? Yeah. Maybe we'll get to the uh, Flying Childers and that still holds sway a little bit. But... Oh, well, hang on. We've got the Malcolm to come yet as well. Oh, yeah. The Mo oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. That's all of that's, that's just <laughs> absolutely. Pure. Well, that's like that's, uh, you talked about the DeLorean. That's the two lines, uh, <laughs> the, the two of tracks of fire. Gone. Great Scott. Great Scott, indeed. Right. Uh, back to <laughs> yeah, the, uh, uh, enough two year olds for now. I was, they're fast. That's it. We call it the super yeah. sprint done. Right, moving on. Hackwood didn't go much of a pace. Grosser Jack, German form. There we go. Job done. See you next. Welcome See you after Goodwoods. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the super sprint, like you said, it, uh, there were a few horses who made uh, slightly sluggish, slightly mm -hmm. sluggish starts. Um, or like uh, the the horse who eventually finished third, uh, Rogue Spirit, the Tom Clover horse, got a little bit worked up. Um, out of the uh, the boxes, got a bit sweaty, which was understandable. It was very hot. Uh, it was a race where you, if you made any slight sort of error uh, in uh, in beginning or, or or preparation, it was brutally punished because um, Eddie's boy had everything go to plan. He had the speed to lie up. He got that rail, and he franked more Royal Ascot form. He did. That's Windsor Castle again, which is. It's often thought of as a poor relation, isn't it, with mm. those two-year-old races at Ascot? But that has been worked out extremely well now. Uh, he had a run in between, didn't he? And didn't didn't run all that well, but yeah. uh, he came out and it's it was. But just, although, admittedly, he he ran behind Rocket Rodney, who was also out of the Windsor Castle. So right enough, yeah. It was did. kind of the form was just repeated. But the way he was 
ridden at Newbury was, you're not going to get away with that at Sandown so well. Uh, he blasted out, you know, he just went go as fast as you can. And that is, when I've been doing sprinters this year, the amount of times I've typed in excused this run or forgiven that, yeah. because anything goes wrong at the start, you're dead. That's kind of why people don't like betting in sprints, isn't it? Yeah. Because you're you're, you're right. punished. I remember the old the old days of, I remember an interview with JP McManus saying that he preferred to have huge bets on the jumps because even if things go wrong, um, you can kind of recover from them. You make a bad mistake, you know, fall from home, you've got time to get back into it, but you get stopped in your run half a furlong from home and you don't have time to yeah. to extricate yourself. And and that and that's even more extreme in these big field five furlong two year old races. Yeah, exactly. And um, it's a you know, jumping mistake, you know, you can see you know a bad jumper, you can find out a bad jumper at home. You can't find out a horse that's gonna find trouble at home, can you? Yeah. Yeah. I had a bet like that on Saturday. Well I wasn't trouble in running, I bet King of Stars at Chester in the three oh eight and if you watched that race it was over after 20 yards. You know, you missed the start and my, I'm tearing up my slip. Yeah. It can be frustrating, but it shows you what happens in a super sprint as well when you get a horse that, you know, uh, he's won, the winner there, he's running two big races so far, he's got a bit professional about him, blast out, get the rail, game over. Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, and the first two were, were pretty experienced. I mean, Woolhampton was coming out of a, a lower grade races, but um, two really good, strong figures at, at Newbury as well. Mm -hmm. Um, but they, they clearly showed the benefits of those uh, that experience. Um, and um, yeah, I, I think if you should, the, the best thing for these races, if you do go back and watch them, mm. you, yeah, you can excuse a horse two or three times, and oh. sometimes by the time you get to the fourth run, people have completely written it off, and, and you get a decent price. Uh, the Hackwood Stakes at the weekend as well. Um, we uh, we said that actually uh, there could be a couple of horses to to come out of that and uh, and go into Group One sprints at the back end of the season, uh, and the winner certainly ticks those boxes. It was a bit unsatisfactory the way it was run. Um, obviously, there were plenty of horses either didn't get the pace that they wanted, or they didn't get the run that they wanted particularly, yeah. uh, or horses like Rohan who kind of burst to the front at the wrong point and then got run out of the, the places late on. He was too far back, Rohan, wasn't he? And he had yeah. his spurt and he had to use himself up to get to the front, didn't yeah. he? That's what happened to Rohan, I, I thought. But the, the winner kind of did a lot wrong. He was he was fresh, he was keen, mm -hmm. um, and if anything, he also maybe challenged a little bit early, but he, 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 he kept going. and Bodied them very easily. Yeah, and Matt Garner was talking about, the, this was a horse we mentioned last week where you kind of, I don't know if it was actually on the show or if it was off air, but you sort of said, ah, oh, Menzar, and Matt was like, oh yeah, I've kind of given up on him. Yeah, because he had, he had last year, he came back last back end. Yeah. And, oh, this is going to be the next big thing. And he ran some good races out looking like a star. And you thought, You're, you've had your chance, have you not? Yeah. But you know, I thought on Saturday, he looked the horse was ready to go and challenge. The race, that Hackwood Stakes, since the champion sprint became the champion sprint, it used to be the diadem or something, didn't it? Since it became, out of the 11 years it's been run, I think, four times the winner ran in the Hackwood. Right, okay. So it's got a good record of translating to that race in particular. And Minzel has got good ascot form. Yeah. So I suspect that's a race for him. Yeah. Uh, and he looks like he's ready to run a really big race that day. So Champions Day, Minzel, be keeping an eye on him because I think that was that was him becoming sort of boy to man uh, in, in the race on Saturday in the Hackwood. Boys to man. I thought, that's why I hesitated. You well, I know, I can see it. I, I nearly, can see it to your brain now. Okay. I nearly broke into the, the, the spoken word bit of end of the road again. Yeah. But um, <laughs> let's not do that. Uh, we can, if you if you want that, please comment below if you'd like to see uh, Keith Melrose's um, Boys to Men rendition. Now, maybe that could be Bandioke. It'd be a good. I mean, I don't think Bandioke are going to be playing. They're not beginning to play flunky pianos, will they? I don't know. I mean, post nuclear apocalypse, who knows what's going to happen? So, um, but uh, in terms of stepping up to uh, uh, to Group One form. Um, we were saying last week about it's a bit easier for the sprinters. In terms of the middle distance horses, we had a, a, a new name on the, the sheet um, uh, uh, in the, the shape of, uh, of Grocer Jack. Um, and it'd be interesting to see what more he's got in store. Yeah. You're laughing there. What's the pun? No, it's just a joke about groceries. Oh, store gross. Gross. Yeah. Ah, yeah. yeah. Sorry, I'll tell you what, you that's, that's really my fault not getting that as well. It's right. okay. It's all right. Because I, I thought it was a pun at first, the thing with Grocer Jack, because he's come from Germany, hasn't he? And it, it could be Big Jack, but it's a song, apparently. We it, played it. Yeah, yeah. Go, go Google the song if, you, if you've never heard it before. It's all over the place, but I have listened to it a lot. If, if you've heard The Kinks, you've heard Grocer Jack. Yes. I, don't, you, I wouldn't rush to, to hear it. He's, he's made his money, Keith West. Yeah. yeah. Um, but yeah, he's. And what I thought, because he has come from Germany, that was his second run just, or third run for Haggis. Yeah. 
And we talked, obviously, after the, the arc last year, everybody was wise after the event with Turkey Tasso, who's going to run in the King George on Saturday, and said, oh, yeah, we write off these German horses too easily, uh, don't we? And yeah, it's easy to see once the horse has won the arc at 80s, yeah. But this is the flip side of it. That horse, Grosser Jack, was good. He was he won a group one in Germany, I think, mm. but you know, ran 112 RPRs or whatever it was, and immediately improving on that for William Haggis. He said, so... It's not to do down German form. It's a co it's not a complicated question of we underestimate German horses. Mm. What it is is these German horses are all bred for middle distances, and generally, I mean, the soft ground thing maybe gets overplayed, but a lot of them do have pedigrees that lend themselves to soft ground. Guess what? You do quite well in the arc. Yeah, um, and but, I mean, but the, the the combination of uh, German middle distance breeding switching to a, 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 a fantastic trainer. Mm -hmm. Uh, targeted to the right race, ridden in the right way, which I'll come to in a second, the way that mm. Newbury on the round track was riding at the weekend, uh, has produced this spectacular performance where, um, you know, he's beat a, what, 108 rated horse by nine lengths. He did, and did, uh, the top speed came out well. So did you, did, were your speed figures good on it? Uh, that is a good question. I didn't do, that's the one race I didn't do this morning. You throw me under the bus there. One job. You throw me, uh, you, we've driven straight through the, um, the veg patch there. Yeah, <laughs> straight to the pitch. I'll have to double Stop. check those. Stop. I'll have to double check those. Um, sorry, I've made a right plan on myself. I'm, I'm but, speaking as your friend, Ross, I'm encouraging you to stop this now. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> Stop it now. Um, but yeah, so it was an impressive performance. Uh, yeah. He's, like I said, he is a bit of a uh, left field entry to the uh, to the middle, middle distance form. Of course, oh. obviously, we've got the King George coming up, which we'll talk about uh, a little bit later on. Um, and then, yeah, all, all roads point to the arc, but how good are we, what are we taking from that the weekend? Of course, so Jack. Yeah. How much more does a horse in that position have to come for William Haggis? How much better is Haggis than your good German trainers is basically what we're seeing now, isn't it? Yeah. Because, yes, the, the breeding's there for these German horses to do really well in, in arcs and King George's, but the tr look, William Haggis is just about the best trainer in the world, almost. He's, mm. he's exceptional. So how much more can he get out of a five-year-old at this level? The, the talk after was he's a funny old ride uh, that he has to sort of, he takes a while to get going and then they have to light him up to get to the front and, and all that sort of stuff, which might be, I don't know if that's, if that's accurate or not, but it sounds like they're going to go champion stakes with him from what I was reading between the oh. lines. So mile it, two, they want a mile two of them. Is there a possibility that the other day um, was, it was his chance to shine because he kind of took everyone by surprise. They kind of, he was able to do what he needed to do, uh, do what he wanted to do, um, whereas rivals in behind might be a little bit more canny next time. If he ends up in a group one that's not got four O'Brien horses in it, yeah. you'll get to do that again. Yeah. You know, how many, we looked at the Eclipse, who's going to lead in the Eclipse? We're looking at the King George on Saturday later, who's going to lead in the King George? He's, in these races, he's going to get that opportunity. Yeah, yeah. In fact, he's probably a replacement for a deep in a lot of ways. Uh, as for uh, the Curra, we had the the Irish Oaks, of course. Uh, Emily Upjohn um, uh, cancelled flights. You couldn't get here because of a cancelled train this morning as well. Oh, country's going to pot. But uh, Jessica Harrington wasn't bothered because uh, Magical Lagoon was uh, not necessarily an impressive winner, uh, of the uh, the group one of the weekend, but what is continuously impressive about Magical Lagoon is that battling quality, even in defeat behind Concert Hall, uh, but also in victory at Royal Ascot and now at the uh, the Curra. Um, and and again, she's she's frank the Royal Ascot form, another Royal Ascot winner, and another Phillies Mile winner as well. Inspire all prosperous boys, Cache and Magical Lagoon were your first four from last year's Phillies Mile. Uh, and they've all come out and won three or all group ones. It's it's the Phillies Dewhurst now, isn't it? Yeah. It might be over a furlong further, but the Phillies equivalent of the Dewhurst is the Rockfell, it's not a group one. Yeah. That Phillies mile is the Phillies equivalent of the Dewhurst. It is really, it last three, four, five years, since it got established at Newmarket, it's just become a much, much better race. It's just, it's the top two-year-old race for Phillies now. Yeah. Probably better than the Marcel Boussac on recent history, I would have said. Well, yeah, because the Marcel Boussac is, you know, the, the go going stick gets swallowed up most years, doesn't it? <laughs> it so does, yeah, yeah, yeah. It can be quite difficult. Um, in terms of uh, the, the Irish Oaks of the weekend, again, uh, there's a potential that people are going to underrate the form again. Um, should we be underrating the form? I mean, uh, it was 112, well, we, wasn't you it? Should, should be, you should be rating the form right. Yeah. And I think the, the call is to do it low. I mean, I apologise for bringing the politics into it, but it's like watching the current next Prime Minister thing a little bit, isn't it? Is it? Yeah, a little bit, because you think one of these bozos is going to be Prime Minister, and it makes you realise that 
being prime minister is not like this massive statesman like thing. It's just if you're the putts that happens to be in the right place at the right time, you can be prime minister. And if you happen to be a really battling low to mid one tens filly, you can win an Irish Oak sometimes. Yeah, if, yeah. if a bird flies into a plane engine and, and just all works out right for you. So yeah, it, it's I did. The, the, there was a rumor that we I did see Jessica Harrington on the tarmac with a <laughs> throwing a bird in the <laughs> with a box of doves. <laughs> but, uh, but it certainly it certainly worked out. It's also worked out because Emily Upjohn will now go to Ascot, which mm -hmm. um, if she wasn't there. I mean, Westover would be on Tom for the weekend, wouldn't it? So it suddenly makes that race a lot more interesting. It does. And we'll come on to that, won't we? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But in terms of the, the weekend, uh, I mean, the main thing to take out of it, again, is Royal Ascot Watch. Sapphire Stakes won by a horse that got punted for the Holyrood Handicap. Yeah, Ladies' Church. It just keeps winning. Um, last week, we had Order of Australia, Morgan Fairy, Magical Lagoon, Ladies' Church, Minzar, Koi Koi, Mr. Wagyu, Reshoon, Little Big Bear, Dynamic Force, Chateau, Perfect Alibi, Fresh Hope, and Sigamia all win on their next start immediately after Royal Ascot. Mr. Wagyu. Mr. Wagyu, yeah. I mean, just I mean, the thing for Royal Ascot form, again, if you... We're past the point of now being able to back it blind and make a profit. However, again, the actual versus the expected, for example, for last week's runners, was still, I think, 0.94, which you, I'm expecting it to drop off a cliff because half of these races have got six, seven, eight runners all coming out of Ascot, but it's, 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 it's still throwing up winner after winner. Absolutely. Now, E over E, as I've sort of demonstrated what we said before, E over E, yes, one's profit, but anything above 0 0.85 is like performing better than the yeah. average. Yeah. So to still be performing better than the average, at prices, you know, and then that's the markets underestimating these horses a bit. Yeah, still remarkable. Yeah, uh, and Ladies Church, of course, won out of that Palace of Holyrood Stakes, um, as did Dynamic Force, who was way down the field, mm. um, and and then Mr. Wagyu won out of the uh, the Wokingham. So the sprints are working out. Keith, you should be on these Royal Ascot form sprinters. I, I, I couldn't believe Mr. Wagyu was joint favourite for that race at the cut. I think it emphasised something about Britain and maybe a bit more atomized than that, as you might come on in a second, but he just looked like he won. He, he was on the right side in the walking arm. He was up there with the pace. He was in the right place all the way in the walking arm, finished fourth. That's where that horse is. That's yeah. that's his level, and yet he's come out next time and showed, you know I mean, he's, he's shown a great attitude and come out and won basically Ireland's walking arm, Ireland's big sprint handicap. Yeah. So I do think there's a, a bigger pool of those sorts of horses in Britain, I would say. Well, we just have significantly more races, don't we? Well, yes. They're all, I mean, most of them are at the Curra. There's one, uh, throw one in at Nace. And why would you have one? Curra. Why would you have one of those horses in Ireland? It's the sort of horse, you know, everybody's we're talking about all these people going and putting their horses from Britain into Ireland. Yeah. But if you had a sprinter, if you had a 95 sprinter, why would you have them in Ireland? You would have them in Britain. Well, unless it's unless it's a Dundalk. I mean, you can actually, <laughs> yeah. you can win about 15 races in the winter. and Unless it can run three furlongs very fast on poly track. Which exactly. Is how every race at Dundalk is won. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Mr. Wagyu, not, it's not just Britain, Keith Melrose. It's not just Britain. It is another vote for Yorkshire. 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 <laughs> no? You're not? You live in Yorkshire. I know, sorry, I've got to do this because I've got too much Yorkshire in the room. I know, but he's, he's gone, he's gone. Now he's you have gone, to fill in for Matt. Dan's from Barnsley, you're yeah. from Sheffield, yeah, Matt's yeah. from York, and I've got to... To be fair, if you cut Dan, he does bleed Hendo's. So <laughs> he's just pure Henderson's relish. Pure Henderson's relish. Yeah. Um, Yorkshire, so yeah, Yorkshire has got an absolute, it's just got a glut of rhubarb, <laughs> chippiness, and not quite group class sprinters. And Yorkshire. I think that's on actually. If you go to welcome to yorkshire.com, that's on the home. Is that page. on the home page? Is that yeah, the Latin yeah. translation of the Yorkshire motto? Yeah, it is, yeah. Uh, but all the, you know, you've got Easter Bay, you've got Quinn, you've got, <laughs> you know, the Fahis and Ryans, you've Midgley, got O'Mara, Midgley, Midgley, O'Mara, Ryan. Yeah, you know, Smart. Yeah. All these Yorkshire based trainers that have got sprinters at that level, there's so many of them. Yeah. Uh, I don't know why it happens to be the case. Because they, I mean, maybe because there's not that many. Uh, of the sort of big Arabian owners have horses in Yorkshire. Yeah. They've got the middle distance ones. Yorkshire ends up with the sort of faster ones. Yeah, it's and also because we, we just don't like to mess about. No messing about. <laughs> uh, but uh, 10 from 93, Yorkshire-based sprinters in handicaps at the Curra. Can you run that query? Yeah, oh, can you? Yeah, that's great. That oh, you can. You, I mean, if you if you if you've got the time, <laughs> you can <laughs> you can dig into as many stats as you like. Nineteen pound fifty uh, level state profit, uh, one point one three actual versus expected. But basically, yeah, your Omaras, your Farhis. Now we didn't mention Brian Ellison earlier. He doesn't have as many sprinters, but he does have. You know, he's 
one of those winners Luke might Khan. be top notch Taunton, might not it? Uh, maybe, maybe. Or uh, even at Galway. There was your Mr. Uh, Mr. Lupton. In fact, I tell you what, the strike rate of Yorkshire based sprinters who start with Mr. must be phenomenal. Um, but Inter Saab, I think, won one for David yes, O'Mara as well. Did, Those kind of horses. Who do run, they run in your Wokinghams, they run in your York handicaps, they run in your. Um, yeah, Abernant stakes and get, get slightly outclassed. Uh, Eastern Impact, those horses from a few years ago. They go over to the Curra, and yeah. And the pool's not the, the pool's not as big because there aren't the races in Ireland. Yeah. So they end up, they don't have to be, you know, they don't, last time Mr. Wagyu's race, it was won by Rohan. Yeah. Who's shaped as well as anything in the Hackwood at the weekend. Yeah, yeah. Because he has the, the options to do it. Mr. Wagyu has, you know, been well placed. And Jum Jumby had gone to the, you know, the Bunbury yes. Cup. So they, there are plenty more options. It's almost as if, like, yeah, the first five or six home in that, you know, had kind of picked their own race to go far, which means that Mr. Wagyu gets to get the boat over to... Um, Arguably the, the best place at all of them. Uh, and, and luckily, I mean, luckily, this, again, if, it's a good job he wasn't on the same flight as Emily Upjohn. Oh, well, yeah. Just as well there was two flights for horses. Going to Ireland over the weekend. He's probably gone. Well, he's gone from Leeds Bradford, hasn't he? It's easy. <laughs> There's barely any security. You just walk straight through. That would have cost him, wouldn't it? It's a lot more to fly from Leeds Bradford. Is it? I don't know. I've made that up. It's about ten quid to get to Ireland from Leeds Bradford. <laughs> Is it? Yeah, yeah. Never done it. They don't even. They literally they switch the engine on for ten minutes. You get to this point, you switch it off, you come back <laughs> down again. Down, yeah. <laughs> it's about twenty minutes. It's amazing. Uh, but yeah, watch out for Yorkshire-based sprinters at the Curra in the uh, in the future. Uh, and finally, one more thing from last week. Was the Glasgow Stakes? Glasgow Stakes, which I also realised as well. Being an Edinburgh boy, that's that's probably why you had a bit of a bit of reluctance. Yeah, yeah. There was a bit. I mean, Hamilton's the only Scottish track I've never been to. Is it? Yeah, mostly because it's they the wouldn't only, let you in. It's the only pure flat track, isn't it? Yeah, I was yeah. always more of a jumps fan as a child. Can, can if if you go to Hamilton, can they can they smell the Edinburgh on you? I don't think so, because they expect Edinburgh folk to all be posh. Yeah, and I'm from the, the wrong side of Edinburgh, really. Right. Uh, so they might not. Wait, they might not are get you, that whiff. Are you what? Are you not? You're a bit posh. What? Aren't you? I played for the same boys' club as Mark Renton. I don't know who that is. The main character in Train Spotting. Oh right. <laughs> yeah, he played for Portobello Thistle. So and I played for Portobello. So I'm I'm from that side. That's the side of Edinburgh. I'm from I'm from the side that they write novels about. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. My friends from Bathgate. Is it? Um, that, that's, that's West Lothian. Is it? Yeah. It's not even Edinburgh, that. Is it not? No. Oh, I've gone down, down a path here. Anyway, anyway the Glasgow Stakes. Uh, West Wind Blows blew them away. Very impressive. And, you know, another little boost for the derby. He, come in, he came in around the derby. El, Al Hadib, uh, right, who was you know, that massive price that finished about eighth in the derby, running a maiden. I always love when derby runners go on a maiden yeah. next time. Yeah. It's a bit like when Bruce Banner, if the Hulk comes back into Bruce Banner. Is it? Yeah, it, is, it is to me, yeah. Sad cello plays. Here's El Javier. He was in the derby last time and here he is in a... I was going to say it's more, more... It's Peter Parker taking photos, isn't it? Yes. Or, yeah, yeah. You know, maybe, maybe you've got it better. You've, you've out marvelled. Like, yeah, just do, doing, a, doing a, uh, a, a, a local... But he's probably not going to be that good because he got beat at odds on, but his West Wind blows. Yeah. Well, he, he won that in an RPR of 113, which is higher than Defoe, Postponed and Subjectivist, all won that race, who all went on to win Group 1 races. And... He also shows a bit like Grosser Jack. There's a higher barrier to yeah. going into, you know, the good uh, middle distance races compared with sprints. You know, he maybe is the equivalent of Minzal in terms of how impressive he was mm. on Friday. But we're talking about Minzal for Group Ones. We're not really talking about Group Ones for West Wind Blows yet. Yeah. Um, you know, I, he, I could see. I mean, the way he races, uh, I could see. You know, cruising along in a great voltager would, would would suit him down to the ground. I think. Yeah, yeah, he can. He might. Well, that's it. He's going to end up maybe as a Group One horse in time, but he still needs to show a little bit more. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, I assume there's a ledger trial next. Is that? Do we think that's what's happening? Well, yeah. Well, I mean, again, I, I haven't. I don't. I don't quite know what the the reins are, but whatever happens, he. He has thrown that. When we were saying last week, oh, this is the race. Yeah, he's exactly that sort of horse, isn't he? Yeah, he is. He is. He very much is that sort of horse. And that is, that is this is vindication. That's why, you watch, that's why you watch these shows, to hear about listed races at Hamilton. Absolutely. That's what the flat pack is all about. Um, I think that just about covers what we, uh, what we took from last week, Keith Melrose. Tell you what, people talk about Super Sprint Weekend being the quietest one of the year. We've got an awful lot out of that. Yeah, we have. And we obviously, for obvious reasons, didn't even mention the summer plate. Didn't mention the summer plate. Yes. Because that's for... Uh, Get back jumps. That's for the jumps, boys. Yeah. Uh, none of that on here.
This week's hot list could easily be, well, everything uh, if you're outside. But let's try and pick out three races that have been throwing up winners and could pay to follow over the next seven days. Starting off with a sprint handicap won by Sablon uh, back in uh, June at Nace, the 22nd of June to be specific. Three winners have already come out of that uh, in the shape of Darren Speedicus and JJ Jumbo. Uh, and interestingly, uh, there are two going back to the track on Wednesday, including the winner, who's up in grade to listed company, but certainly looks up to it on that evidence, uh, and Superior Force, who was beaten into mid-division on that occasion, but goes back uh, into handicap company on Wednesday. So that could pay to watch. Uh, Alethiometer was a nice winner at Doncaster uh, back on the 1st of July. He has been beaten since uh, in a better race, but those in behind have given the form a boost. Both the second and the third, Gypsy Whisper and Miss Bella Brand have come out and won. And there are a couple of interesting runners out of that race entered this week. Nikki's Girl uh, is entered on Wednesday and Emily Post uh, for the Bethel team, who deserve a bit of a change of look, goes to Newmarket on Friday. And finally, Wiki Wiki Wheels was a nice winner at Hamilton uh, last week and then followed up again back at the same track. Uh, Pon Alias, who finished second for Mark Johnston, uh, won next time out as well. Uh, so that form looks pretty strong. It was a very good speed figure for the grade. Uh, and Pon Alias is entered again at Newcastle this weekend. And Tim Easterby's Brazilian Beach, who is outclassed, drops in grade later in the week. So there are your three races for the hot list. Let's hope they are as hot as the temperature currently going on outside and we'll get winners galore over the next seven days. Well, if last week was in theory a quiet one for the flat season, it's certainly not the case over the next seven to ten days. We've got Ascot, of course, coming up on Saturday with the King George and some tasty handicaps, ably supported by your Sandowns, your Leopards Downs and your Yorks over the next few days as well. And then next week, it's glorious Goodwood. Uh, and we'll be having a little bit uh, of a look at some golden rules uh, ahead of next week's five-day extravaganza. Uh, but first, uh, let's work our way through the next few days of flat action. Of course, with Ascot taking centre stage on, uh, on Saturday, Keith, we'll come to that in a second because, again, the point of the flat pack is to tell you that there are races left, right and centre, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday nights, We've got interesting action uh, up and down the country and over in Ireland as well. We do. Um, and uh, you, you you picked out a couple of races that caught your eye. One at Sandown and one at Leopardstown. So yeah. let's, go to, uh, let's go to Isha first. So we had the Star Stakes. That's on Thursday night. Yeah. And uh, it's a race the last two years has been won by Fev Rover and in Spiral. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Fev Rover, she placed in a Guineas? Or, a, or was it an Oaks? She's placed in, she placed in a Classic. Did she place in a Classic? Yeah, she did place in a Guineas. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And uh, obviously in Spiral, uh, it was a dominant two-year-old, mm. uh, could hopefully might yet still be the dominant miler. Uh, so yeah, it's a race that has got a tendency to uh, to work out fairly well, shows up some good horses, so well worth watching, and we're going to get a test for the Chesham form, I think. Yeah. The Chesham is one of the very few Royal Ascot races we've not seen tested that much yet, for reasons you can probably infer, you know, these are yeah. slightly more backwards two-year-olds in theory. Uh, it's one of the I first... think some of them are still finishing as well, given, <laughs> given the, uh, the form of the race this year, but... Um, like you said, but it hasn't, it hasn't been properly tested. It is always a race that, uh, you know, yeah, it's a, it's a three-year-old race for two-year-olds, isn't it? Well, we say that, but Pinatubo won it. Yeah, that is true. Uh, and that, what was that battleground? He didn't do much as a three-year-old and he won it. No, okay. So I think people have started taking advantage in recent years of the fact that Chesham is seen as a three-year-old race for two-year-olds and started running two-year-olds in it. Yeah. So, Although notably the winner looked like he might make a nice chaser in time. The winner was the winner was the first winning social runner since God knows when, wasn't he? So, so, um, so yeah, it doesn't bode well for the form, but we'll find out for definite this week, hopefully. Yeah. We've had a few out of it, but nothing to particularly get too excited about. Dark 30, of course, um, ran okay uh, the other day at, uh, at Newmarket. And um, to be fair, Legend of Xanadu ran okay as well, but it's just okay so far. But we've got the, the both place horses running on Thursday, potentially. Yeah. Um, but... Um, we do have some interesting uh, potential types coming up against them. We've got, obviously, like you said, you've got, um, you've got Queen Ollie as well, who mm -hmm. um, I thought was uh, run a really nice race the other day in the, at the Cherry Hinton. And we've got a couple of nice first-time out winners. Um, we've got, I think, Lady Alara for Charlie Hills has entered. That looked quite nice at Newbury. Uh, and a horse called Dance in the Grass, um, who won over course and distance for Mark Johnson in a race that's working out really well. I thought she looked very nice indeed. Yeah, uh, to be honest, I've not watched that. I've seen the Well, you're not, the two-year-old man's not here, not here is, is he? I mean, I've looked at the results, how the form's worked out, and the form has worked out well, but, you know, come on, Matt. It's his, it's his area of expertise. Yeah. Albeit, I thought that the Johnson horse who ran um, 
at uh, Newmarket, Lion of War. I thought, oh, he's got a few nice, got Doorknock Castle, Lion of War, Dance in the Grass. He might have some nice two-year-olds, but that one ran an absolute shocker. So, it, it, yeah, he, he is a trainer that sometimes, because we associate Johnson with slow-burning types, when they win first time out, you can get a bit carried away. Well, yeah, and also, he has been quite good with being straight out of the gate with two-year-olds recently. Mm -hmm. I mean, he had Norfolk horses the last few years, really. Yeah. Didn't, he's not and had horses like that this year, has he? Vizinari, of course. Vizinari. We're not, we're, not, we're not going into Vizinari. That's just a giraffe. That, was, that horse had gigantism, basically. Yeah. So, yeah. He's doing well now, at the uh, age of winning, six. Winning, pic is. winning picnic races in Australia, isn't he? Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, I mean, yeah, but he Johnson does generally. I think Johnson's actually had a little bit of a slower year, as my perception as somebody that's not watching the two-year-olds to Gardner levels. Yeah, yeah. Um, but maybe once the seven furlong races start coming in, he'll start he'll start showing because the horses are generally bred to stay a bit further. Yeah. Um, Leperstown on on Thursday as well. Uh, the the Tyros, the Tyros, Tyros. I go Tyros. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Because um, I had it in my head that race was, you know, it was a race that Jim Bolger used to use with Teofilo and New Approach and those good horses. And I thought, is it the same race as it used to be? And yeah, it's not competitive. There's a lot of one to five winners in there, but it's been won by, I've written the list in front of you. Can we read Church, it now? Churchill, Glen Eagles, Armory, uh, Anthony Van Dyke, wasn't yep. it possibly? Went on to win the Derby, obviously. And Point Lonsdale. Point Lonsdale, who hasn't run, but he ended up a season as one of the top two year olds, you know, won, won some good two year old races. Yeah, so. yeah. Uh, yeah, it's actually a race that O'Brien now runs some of his good horses in. Yeah. So keep an eye on that one. Yeah, okay. Uh, and um, Age of Kings has entered amongst amongst others, some more Ascot form potentially, um, which takes us quite nicely into Ascot uh, this weekend, uh, where we have the the King George. We've also got the International, uh, the the seven furlong handicap. We've also got a 0 to 105 mile handicap for horses who. I don't know. Didn't fancy running in the international. Is also, it for horses that haven't been bought by Hong Kong yet? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Because this, we need a, we need a for the highlights package at the back end of the season. Britannia winners, Britannia horses going to Hong Kong. Thesis has gone. Thesis. Saga's entered though ah, in the mile handicap. Okay. So that's, yeah, that's what. So it's four horses that haven't yet been. Was a Britannia not enough evidence for you, lads? Let's run you in this race, and then we'll make sure of it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's just like it's for it's for the people who are like mm, not sure we want to invest yet. And you're like, right, right. Here's another one for you. A bit like barrier trials in Ireland. That's what they're that's what they're all for. Isn't yeah, it? it's just a shop window. It's a massive shop window. Yeah. Um, uh, we'll start off with the handicaps actually, I think, um, mm. and then we'll go on to the uh, the King George um, because of course we've got the international, and I want to I want to get back into that. that 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 vibe we had with the Woking, and where you looked at me and you said it can't be this easy. It can't be this easy. <laughs> so we've got a little, we've got a little flat pack checklist for Ascot handicap winners, right? Yes, we do. So that's yeah, we, we formed this for the Wokingham. I mean, I didn't. Yeah. You're making out like you won a lot of money there. I, I had a small win on the Wokingham. It wasn't, wasn't. Much. No, it wasn't. It was, it was more that you, you, I, I simplified it, and you said I think you're oversimplifying it, and then it yes. worked out perfectly. And it did basically work out perfectly. Yeah. Apart from the horse, that was, yeah, Rohan just would have been a, a lovely result, but for Rohan, wasn't that the case for both of us? I mean, yeah, if Rohan had got up, yeah, it was, I mean, to be fair, the one you backed was the one that didn't fit into my criteria, so. What was that again? Popmaster. Oh, yes. So, which is much better said in your accent. But that's only because of Ken Bruce. Yeah, of course. Absolutely. But he's not even from my bit of Scotland, I don't think. No, but he's much closer than I am. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> um, flat pack checklist for finding the winner of Ascot uh, handicaps. Form over further. Yep. Uh, has to have a bit of a, a cruising speed. Has to be able to travel, yeah. Yeah, a bit of a traveller. Um, a high draw is obviously, uh, or, or at the very least, right next to a rail. Well, yeah, the, the high draw is a percentage call. Things can change at Ascot, but yeah. generally speaking, last Ascot meeting, uh, high was where you wanted to be in that five for yeah, yeah. sprint. Well, all of them, yeah. They all yeah, came, all yeah. Of them. You know, I only watched the sprints, <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah. Those, you, both those I saw high draws. Yeah. Uh, and of course, the Royal Ascot form is, uh, is working out very nicely indeed, which, I mean, the current favourite is Dark Shift, and if he goes, I mean, I could... he fits it perfectly, doesn't he? Unless, unless, unless he gets five drawn in two, two. <laughs> yeah. Unless he goes off and gets drawn in two. Yeah, yeah, possibly. Uh, but uh, he, yeah, he does. He was second. Was it second in the Hunt Cup? No, he won it. He won it. Yeah, yeah of course he won the Hunt. Yeah, he was. He was, um, yeah, he, was, he, was he was Les Dawson's big bet of the week. Yes, he was, and Kitty backed him as well. You know, he won the Hunt Cup, didn't he? So he's, you know, he's got that mile form. Yeah. Now he's dropping back to seven. Royal Ascot form, obviously, it being the Hunt Cup. So he. He is a massive qualifier on those trends. So I had a bit more of a, uh, a dig into the uh, the stats uh, for the international. Um, 116 horses have tried who've never run over further than seven furlongs. None of them have won. So you have to have been tested over further, like we were saying. Um, 
337 of them have run who have won over no further than seven, but have run. Mm -hmm. Only seven of them won. It's a 2% strike rate. 228 of them have run with wins over further. 17 have, run, have won. That's a 7% strike rate. So again, it is consistently pointing towards that like, extra bit of stamina, which it sounds obvious. It but does, but it's, it doesn't... What's really nice about that angle, actually, is how you've got form over further and tanks through a race. Because yeah. that's going to short... That's going to whittle down your shortlist pretty quickly. Yeah, well... And the main one that's, that, that, that stood out to me by an absolute mile, and he's been—he's clearly, he's one of those horses that everyone thinks is going to win one of these races. He's a bless him, basically. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is air to air, who is 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 a, he's an absolute. You know, he, he, he was. I think he was favourite or second favourite for the Britannia last year. Mm -hmm. um, he's he, he bolted up over a mile at Yarmouth last time out, quickening up. You know, in the blink of an eye, clearly to get him into this race as well. He's got Ascot form. He's won over further. He's the, but he's normally a Spencer ride, and, and you know what you're going to get. But Kieran Schumacher was on him last time, so yeah. And if he's going to be a Spencer ride again, Ascot's a place where you you don't mind that at all. Yeah, as discussed before. You yeah. know, you don't want to be on the front particularly. Um, I thought King's Aim was a little bit interesting as well. Um, he's uh, been running over ten furlongs, but has one over a mile. And Star of Orion, who finished second in this last year, a lot of people have tipped him up plenty of times. I thought he's be interesting. It mm -hmm. might well be that they have been getting him down. He's been running in the Bunbury Cups and the. Um, the Buckingham Palace. This is this is a race for him, really, isn't it? As well. Yeah, it feels like. All, it. No, it's racing. It's racing sand in there that I see in the entries when I looked. Through. I think he's in the mile and he's in both. He's in both, but I mean, he's a he, he best forms on a bit softer, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but yeah, he's just a typical horse that runs in all these races. Finishes. He's a blessing. Yeah, he's a blessing. Yeah. Uh, I've not had a, I had a good look at the international without having a look where I'd have a bet in it. The one I was when I was looking at this race, Anthony Post, there was a horse. Do you remember that I said I wanted back for it? Yeah, and it was Diodar who yep. ran in the Lethal Levi race yep. at the July meeting, but he's listened to you. They've dropped back in trip with him from yep. six. He was in, run over the six for a long race. He was entered in the international over seven. They've actually dropped him back to five to the last race on the same card. Yeah, uh, the last race on Saturday at Ascot. That will be an interesting watch. Yeah, and again, I, nine of the last ten had won over six or seven furlongs, and the only one who hadn't had, had run over six and seven. That was only spoofing. So it, it's it's just it, and, and Latin Lover is the perfect example, isn't it? Yeah, who had been dropping back from six furlongs, had been travels keen, had been being beaten half a length in those, those big six furlong races. Dropped back to five, wins at Royal Ascot, bang on the line. So you're going to be all over Deirdre. I think I'm going to have to back him. Yeah. Yeah, depending on... I've had a look at the race and it's, it's a strong race. You know, there's a few yeah. horses from that uh, Heritage Handicap the other week that was on ITV. Uh, so, you know, if they put him in at 9-4, to four, I might not, but... Yeah, yeah. Uh, cool. He's he's definitely going to be right on the shortlist. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, so uh, a few pointers. Uh, there's the flat pack checklist for handicaps at Ascot this weekend. Uh, the big race, of course, is the uh, the King George, um, which uh, big again in prestige, certainly not big in... Uh, field size, but we've gotten used to that by now. Um, but it is an interesting clash of not only generations, but also uh, Derby versus Oaks form. Uh, like I said, the the Curra's loss is Ascot's gain. Uh, and also, from a breeding perspective, Frankel versus See the Stars, uh, Westover versus Emily Up, John, your three-year-olds versus your five and your six-year-olds, and with your Mishrifts and, uh, and Brooms. So... Yeah. It's, again, small field, slightly disappointed in one way, hopefully it won't be messy, but it probably no, will. Yeah, it probably will be messy, although we've seen from both the three-year-olds, the big three-year-olds, yeah. evidence that they can quicken in slightly messy races. The Irish Derby yep. was a bit like that. Westover quickened very well. The Oaks was a very fast finish. Emily Upjohn quickened well in that. And what been, at the time, we said the Oaks might, be, might not be all that, but the first two are really good. Yeah. So we've not had that tested to a great extent yet. Tuesday's running the Irish Derby, we can throw out in Nashville, who was third. She's won, obviously, the Diane. And then Westover, we've always said the Dar oh, Derby form's good, and we've sort of been sticking by that. Here's the, here's the real test. Here's Westover taking on Mishref, Broom. You know, these aren't... Mishref's a bit of a star, but these aren't superstars, but they're going to tell you where these three-year-olds are, hopefully. Yeah. And all we need is a race that gives us that. Um... In terms of, you pointed out, uh, yeah, Frankel versus See the Stars. In it's terms the of biggest you. clash between those two as sires in a race. Because I, I don't know about you, but I've been sick of hearing it all over the years about who was better, Frankel or See the Stars. Like, lads, See the Stars, you just like trophies. Frankel, you like ratings. Fine, just agree to disagree. Yeah. I'm sick of it. 
Beatles Frank, versus the Rolling Stones. A wee bit, but the Beatles were better and Franco was better than See the Stars. Uh, <laughs> I agree. Excellent. Well, we solved it. Uh, yeah, solved it all. That's it. Pubs, pub chats are closed down forever. Pub, pub's closed. It's too hot. <laughs> um, but yeah, this is the biggest clash between those two is Sires, which is really quite interesting. Yeah. Uh, um, this, this year, Frankel's had eight uh, Group 1 winners from 24 globally. See the Stars had two from 15. So, see the stars is, uh, is, is, is see the star is on the way. Uh, as for the the rest of the Ascot card, uh, we've also got the Princess uh, Margaret, uh, uh, the uh, the Group Three for two year olds as well. Um, just keep an eye on Cherry Hinton form coming out of that. Uh, eight winners from thirty two. Lazoo, of course, was a little bit unlucky in that uh, and is entered. Uh, and then we get to uh, to other meetings at the weekend, uh, mainly uh, in the shape of the Knavesmire. Uh, we've got a bit of York action. Um, now, there are sprints on the card. Yeah. Silver Samurai Drain. Good old Sammy. Your your new favourite horse who yeah. um, bombed out in the Wokingham. <laughs> yeah, he did. He was, he was the wrong side. He dropped out eight, wasn't he? He was. He was completely uh, So he had no chance. He was, he, he was one of about 20 horses in that race that got excused Wokingham written on their, my notes yeah. that I keep. Uh, so, yeah, he is... But he's, he's a, a horse with course form. I mean, this is York. It's not Ascot. No, it's it. Yeah, he's, I mean, we said, we, before you looked it up, we both said... Is he a York horse? Yeah. Because he's he gets held up, he gets presented late. Uh, and he has run half length second, which absolutely figures yeah. on his only run at York so far, hasn't he? Over that's seven furlongs. Over it? seven furlongs. So that it's a really warm race that six furlong. It's not 105, I think, it's not yeah. open ended, but yeah, really hot race that I'm going to be watching there uh, at York on Saturday. And and yeah, Sammy's been put in his second fav, but we'll see what we get in terms of draw and where he is and I might yeah. go back him. But what are you most looking forward to this weekend? Oh, what am I most looking forward to? I think that's got to be a King George, doesn't it? I mean, it, it's just... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. I thought you were going to throw a curveball in. I was. Part. I did think about it and I thought, can I really see a six for long handicap at York over? I'm not quite there yet. I'm not quite yeah. that much of a sprint in my head. Because a King George, as we said the other week, it still is the best race yeah. in Britain in terms of the the, the, the the ratings at the end of the season or which is how the pattern committee judges them. It's still the best race run in Britain. It, and, and it might be this year if Westover and Emily Upjohn are the horses we think they are. Yeah. So yeah, it's going to answer a lot of questions, hopefully. Okay. Uh, it's also going to answer a question about the, the German middle distance breeding again. Yes. Well, yeah, we've got Tor Torquato Tasso running and we've had a couple of German winners of the race. Dane Dream. Ground was technically good to, well, it was officially good to soft the year she won it. I forget where the ground, I think it was quite firm when Novelist won the race. Mm, yeah, I don't know. Um, but yeah, he was a different. He wasn't an arc sort of horse, whereas obviously Torquato Tasso was. Dane Dream, she'd won the arc the year before she came over, and I think she beat Nathaniel from mm. what I remember. Uh, so yeah, it's we'll test that form. How fit is he? How much is this season just about the arc? You know, he is twelve to one on his best form. You'd say that's a really big price, but yeah, is, is it just one race for him this year? And you suspect the answer to that's yes. Okay. Um, well, I hope you enjoy the weekend. Uh, let us know what you're uh, you're taking from it uh, ahead of, of next week, where of course it is glorious Goodwood. Uh, and uh, well, just in a second, we'll be back with some golden rules for glorious Goodwood. Uh, and I think the golden rule for the man to my right might be to take the week off. Uh, Goodwood. I think my I think Goodwood the track is doing a disservice to the occasion because. I really struggle at Goodwood. Yeah. When you wrote down, ask for golden rules, we've got a little doc that we share to write things down. My sole suggestion for Glorious Goodwood was a picture of Simon Pegg. Uh, the reference being, let's go down the Winchester until this all blows over, like yeah. in Shaun of the Dead. Um, Continuing the apocalypse vibe of yeah, the show. Yeah, tell you what, if this show is summed up by anything this week, it is apocalyptic vibes. Yeah, by the way, if you did hear someone, I, I, maybe maybe that's it, maybe we're sort of scraping a chair upstairs. Thank or, God for that. Or the zombies are breaking in. Oh, <laughs> wouldn't it be great? <laughs> uh, but in terms of glorious good one next week, yeah, I think you've just got so this. We've talked about this before about other tracks. We talked about it about York. Mm -hmm. I think I mentioned it about Air as well. But certain tracks that I used to really struggle at, uh, I had to have a good sit down with myself, myself a good talking to, um, and and go, why am I getting this wrong? And it's mainly because you you just approach it in the wrong way. You need to approach it right. You need to approach it like it's its own chaotic entity. That yeah, that's fine. Yeah, right. So carry on. Well, there's a few. I mean, I've rules. got that far. First things first. We were talking about most tracks being front-running, speed-favoring tracks. No, absolutely not. Goodwood is not. It's completely the opposite of that. It is, and I think people think because of the the, the, the way they get rolling, it's a switchback track and all that kind of thing. They think you can, you know, 
I mean, yeah, you're right. When I did a little bit of satellite work on it, I think it was last year. Yeah. I expected it to be a helter skelter. But yeah. the last three furlongs is basically flat. Yeah. Is that right? Well, Apart from the camber. Yeah, yeah. There's more tilt on the course than there is tilt. You yeah. Know, down. So, but it, but it, it means that it's it's harder to judge the when to kick. It also you've also people start to ha- it's a bit Epsom esque in the sense they hang over to that far side rail, and then you also have these horses kind of switching out and quickening up down the middle and it happens time and time and time again and it, it it's just chaos if you if you time it badly uh, and i think you just got to get that out of your head that that you can you can switch into the the, the home straight and, and kick on hmm. and 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 just know that in if you know i think in the last 150 yards something's going to come rattling down the middle and you just accept that every now and then it might be something you've backed Right. I think it's all right. Now, I'll tell you what, you've made a good point there that's re- uh, registered with me because the amount of times I've watched a Sussex stakes, for instance, yeah. they've turned in and I've gone, oh, here we go, lad, Sussex is starting now. There's still 20 seconds before they start racing. Yeah. So, yes, you're right with that one. It, 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 it does take you a little bit longer to get going than I would maybe appreciate having never been. A lot longer, a lot longer. So I think you just completely ignore from what it is. In fact, just, you know, high drawn, switched off at the back, come down the centre of the, the, the course fast and late. The kind of horses that drive you mad at every other race course because they don't quite get there. Is that what it is? I think that's what it is. Wow, yeah. right. right. I'm going to try this. So I'm going to, yeah, keep an eye on that. Except... Over five furlongs. Oh, yeah, five furlong trash is brilliant, though, isn't it? Yeah, where they just go, it's just, and they're off, and uh, they've gone, and they've won. Yeah. So, good. it's um, obviously for the the, the the other King George, mm-hmm. uh, and uh, the Malcolm, and uh, some nice sprint handicaps as well. I also thought, so I had a little bit of a dig into the stats about form around a bend, because, like we are saying, there's, there's not that many tracks that teach you the things that Goodwood needs to win. Yeah, the only angle I've ever got at Goodwood that had any semblance of working was was putting it beside Epsom. Yeah, except, see, and I thought that, and so I went through again the the impact values of basically I looked at seven furlongs plus mm-hmm. at, at, at tracks that have your separate sprint tracks and your uh, and your um, your round tracks, and I thought, okay, which ones are throwing up profit? Which ones are throwing up good angles? Yeah, you would have you would have assumed Epsom would be right up there. People say, you know, we. He's won at Brighton or whatever, so surely Goodwood will suit. Um, Haydock, Thirsk, Bath, Musselburgh. Right. What I've come to realise over the past day or two is that Goodwood is the Southern Thirsk. It's a speed favouring straight track where they don't seem to come from the back. And when you get onto the round course, they turn into the home straight, you think, oh, I've got a chance here. And then you see something come ranging down the middle and it rattles home. To uh, to break the heart yeah, of those on the oh, rail. There's, oh, that happens all the time at Thirsk. It does. Prop, it's, it, you know, you, you get people talking about the Thirsk Hunt Cup thinking, oh, he's quite well drawn in three. And you're like, no. Oh. You need to be in 16 and you need to come down the centre of the track as late as humanly possible. Whereas you just don't get there on the sprint track. You, you don't. Do you it. don't. You cannot do it. Is there occasionally a golden rail too? Or is that asking too much of the comparison? At, at, on, at, on the sprint track? At Goodwood. Yeah, yeah, possibly, yeah. Sometimes on that near one, isn't there? Or... But I think the round track is really interesting. It's really interesting because, like I said, so Bath almost has a similar thing. You see the head on at Bath. Mm. It's like um, it's like Top Gun. You see, you know, you see the, the the fighter jets pulling out to come down the centre of the oh, track yeah, and rattled yeah, yeah. home. Um, same at Thirst, but also Haydock as well. I'm back to two year old that won the other night at, at, at Haydock, and at no point did I think it was going to win until it got up and won. Yeah, it does happen a bit here, don't it? Yeah, maybe, maybe it does. Muscle brother, you're gonna to have to explain that one to me. Well, so when I was going into this, it, it, it kind of churned up muscle bra staying form. Um, Aye. The, the 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 if your last win came at muscle bra, uh, you have an exceptional record. Stayers last win at muscle bra. If your last win was at muscle bra over a mile and a half plus, and you run a good win next time, and you not necessarily next time, but your oh. last win came up. Oh, your last win came so You might have won at Musselburgh, you've gone to Ascot, it didn't suit, you went to York, it didn't suit, okay. you went somewhere else, it didn't suit. Yep. You turn up at Goodwood, incredible record. You've got Sir Chauvelin, uh, you had um, uh, Smart Press, got Timoshenko. Oh yes, that, yeah, that middle park horse. It's the, it's the Edinburgh Cup, you're just Huberts. They really, really work out well. Six winners from 49, £12.24 stake at profit, 1.74. Uh, actual versus expected. Wow. So there's those Edinburgh Cups, your mile and a half, two mile handicaps at Musselburgh, 
and then you go to Goodwin and you underrate it. So there's a weird angle for you. It is. I'm trying to justify it now because I've, I've people that have read today's racing post will know I try to write up sort of tips about muscle bra and, and like how the track works. Yeah. Because it's a track I've probably been to more than any other. And is it just because it's got another deceptively long straight? Possibly over those trips, seven furlongs at Musselboro, you can't get anywhere near you. Well, no, it's you? because you've got you've got a hairpin bend after two furlongs. Yeah. Um, but but it's, it's a similar angle, yeah, again, at Musselboro. When you turn into the home straight at Musselboro, you're right, here we go. And you go, no, here we go, okay, hang up, no, right, okay. And then... And you still struggle to come from the back, though, no matter how much that looks like happening at Musselboro. It does seem to be like that. Yeah, possibly. But, yes, you're right. You're thinking, and it's why you think, well, why did they struggle to come from the back? They've got so long to get there. Yeah. Because they do have a long time to get there. The five furlong spot at Muscle Bros is about the length of this room. You've got to time it right. It's timing, isn't it? And that's the same thing with Goodwood. It's when to make your challenge, I think. And then and, and those tracks, they 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 teach you the same things. Haydock's the same. Over over seven foot, over a mile plus or whatever at Haydock, you turn into the home straight and you can get racing a hell of a long way out. And suddenly there's a wall of horses and there's horses switching down the middle. So I thought the main thing to, for me to keep an eye on for Glorious Goodwood next week was, was horses whose last win came at Haydock going to Goodwood uh, in, in, in races. So I went to try and pick a few uh, out of that. Um, who put 50 in you? I thought it was very interesting. Oh, yeah. No, he's an interesting horse generally. He, uh, of course, was placed in the, uh, the Britannia. Mm -hmm. uh, he won the Silver Cup, uh, Silver Bowl, sorry, at Haydock. Yeah, he looked very good that day. He's entered in the Golden Mile. I thought he could be interesting. Aldari. Would you dare have a bet in the Golden Mile before the draw? No. No, yeah. no that's another thing. Drawn low. Drawn low. Um, Aldari in the Lennox Stakes. He looked very impressive mm -hmm. last time out at Haydock. Um, free Wind, of course, um, in the, uh, entered in the Lily Langtree. Uh, contact for the Barons, I thought could be quite interesting. Mm -hmm. thought the track could suit him. Um, but the one I'm really hoping runs is Nathaniel Green. The Stayer. Yeah, the Haggis Stayer, who won that three-year-old handicap. Well, there's a mile and a half three-year-old handicap, isn't there? Oh, yes, there is, because horses sometimes come from that and run in group races. Yeah. Um, so Ron Priestley, I think, won it. Yes, he's not right, ago. yeah. Um, and I think he won that same race at Haydock as well. So I'm really looking forward to him. So I mean, that form looked absolutely mustard yeah. at the time the Nathaniel Green form, didn't it? Yeah, so I'm hoping... So uh, I'm going to have to try and clarify those golden rules, aren't I? Don't back front runners. Don't back low draws on the round track. Back front runners over five furlongs who are on the speed. Follow Haydock Thirst bath form uh, over uh, over uh, seven furlongs to mile and a half. Must have perform over stay in trips. And Keith Melrose will see you in the pub. Yeah. Down to Winchester until this all blows over. I think that's about sums it up. I think so. I'm going to try your tip. This is, I'm going to end up losing loads of money again at Goodwood this year because I'm going to follow your advice now. I'm going to see if that's cracked it. Well... It worked for the Glasgow Stakes. Did it? Did you take that horse at one? No. That brings to an end this week's episode of the Flat Pack. Then we're having next week off, uh, or at least we are for this show anyway. Of course, Glorious Goodwood will be taking all of our attention. And we'll be back in two weeks to pick out the best angles and the most unlucky horses that Keith Melrose has backed, of course. Uh, any comments, any thoughts, any feelings, please let us know down below and we'll give you a name check and a shout out in a fortnight's time. Till then, stay safe. Stay cool, and if you can't, come join us underground in Leeds.